It is quite an honor to be asked to present at this meeting and to be the first one, the lead-off speaker. So I'll also extend my welcome to all of you for your participation. The task in front of me is, in 30 minutes, to uh, describe how I treat Hodgkin lymphoma. And I've had to make a number of very specific choices in doing so. So I will be presenting exactly that, um, how I go about doing it. And I'll, I've tried to pick out the and select those items from the literature and from our clinical trials and other experiences that most uh, specifically support the assertions that I'll be making. But of course, there are some situations in which we don't have such guidance. And then we'll be looking together at what available evidence is there. And I'll be trying to sort through at least what I think is a sensible way to proceed. This is my disclosure slide showing the sources of research funding that uh, I and my institution received to <coughs> conduct some of the research that I'll be mentioning. And uh, I will be discussing the off-label drug use, possibly, of rituximab and brentuximab vedotin. <coughs> I have a, a, a delightful task, in a sense, because we've been accumulating information about this disease uh, for in excess of 180 years. That's a long time, and that's a time for observations of uh, quite extended um, publications in the literature and experience to justify the approaches that we take. And so we're on a very solid evidence base in most cases. But when we're not, I'll try to explain to you how I thought through and reasoned to the kind of approach that I would like to take. I'll divide the topic up into limited and advanced stage, relapse disease, and some special challenges because um, the treatment for the Hodgkin lymphoma isn't always in the simplest of circumstances and there are some special circumstances that do need to be taken into consideration. Hodgkin lymphoma can be divided into the classical subtype, about 95% of cases, and the non-classical lymphocyte predominant nodular type of Hodgkin lymphoma, about 5% of cases. I would say that for the past 20 years anyways, the diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma and the different specific subtypes has been quite accurate. Literature before that time is contaminated by perhaps as many as 5 to 10 percent of cases of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. But in more recent eras, with immunophenotyping and all of the techniques available to our pathologists, this can be made, this diagnosis can be made very accurately. We'll focus first on classical Hodgkin lymphoma. This is a slide you'll see several times. It's my overall approach uh, to the various uh, types or presentations or stages of Hodgkin lymphoma. And as I said, I'll try to justify each of these as I go along. We start with the staging of the disease, and it has an orderly pattern of spread, typically starting superdiaphragmatically through escalating echelons of lymph nodes, possibly eventually involving lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm at stage three, entering the spleen, moving into the circulation, the general circulation, and contaminating uh, typically up to about four different sites of extranodal disease. Typically the bone marrow, lungs, bone, or liver are the sites that you'll, you'll find Hodgkin lymphoma when it's spread outside the lymph node system. We also attach prognostic significance to the presence of constitutional symptoms, B symptoms, that you're all familiar with applying in your clinical practice. If we then focus in on the patients with limited stage disease, I'm now talking about regionally confined disease, Ann Arbor stage one or two, patients without uh, constitutional symptoms, patients without uh, large or bulky tumors. So here we have an approach that can offer in excess of 90% of the patients cure with the first round of treatment that they receive. Over time, we've learned to balance the potential usefulness and the potential toxicity of the two major modalities that we have, and have settled on brief chemotherapy to deal with control of the local disease and especially control of the potential extensive occult disease that we may not have discovered at the time of our staging. This is then complemented by limited field radiation therapy establishing firm local control of the disease by keeping the chemotherapy brief and the radiotherapy limited, we can minimize the toxicity of each of those tools and most uh, build on their specific virtues. So we have some specific questions to answer. What chemotherapy, how many cycles, radiotherapy field and dose, and do you always need the radiotherapy? Well, <clears throat> let's try to answer those questions one at a time. What chemotherapy? I'm going to settle on ABVD as the regimen of choice, and in this case, 
uh, have done so because of the extensive comparisons that have been conducted of ABVD to at least 16 other recipes used for the disease. And in each case, it has performed at least as well and often superior to the other recipes. And has done so both in terms of the efficacy, control of the disease, but also uh, I, holding in check the major cumulative toxicities of myelosuppression that can be associated with the agents. The <clears throat> trials that have helped us to sort out, after having chosen the basic recipe, uh, <clears throat> how much of this to give are consistent with the results from this very large one from the German Hodgkin study group in which you can see that one of the contrasts and the comparisons made on the randomized basis was between the uh, choice for two cycles of ABVD or the choice of four. I'll tackle that question first and return to the radiotherapy question in a moment. And the data from the study are gratifyingly good. You can see that both the failure-free survival and the overall survival with the choice of, of two cycles or four cycles is equally good, justifying the choice that I've made for just two cycles of that chemotherapy. How about field and dose? The first hint that the field could be reduced substantially came from a small Italian study, slightly underpowered, but at least it gave us some insight. After brief chemotherapy, in this case four cycles of ABVD, patients were randomized to involved field or extended field. And the graphic results <coughs> make it clear that the involved field of radiotherapy performed just as well as the extended field. The Final uh, look at the use of radiotherapy in this situation dwelt upon dose. And so here back to that same trial from the Germans, you can see the contrast was between 20 and 30 gray of involved field radiation therapy. And once again, we have a nice tie between the two approaches, documenting the fact that <clears throat> in this limited extent of the disease, we can rely on ABVD two cycles and involved field radiotherapy. But it is reasonable to ask when we have such a powerful tool as the four-drug chemotherapy recipe whether it's always necessary to embark on including the use of radiotherapy in the patient's management. There are reasons to justify considering dropping the radiotherapy that are attached to the potential long-term toxicity that I'm not going to discuss in detail, but we ought to be including a, a regimen or a recipe of treatment for our patients when there's a clear necessity to do so. And if it can be eliminated without any penalty or with the tiniest of penalties, we might at least consider dropping it for some patients. The trial that best examines this is the RAPID trial from England. And you can see that the structure of the trial was for patients to receive brief chemotherapy. All these patients had limited stage disease. Brief chemotherapy and then to be evaluated with functional imaging. If it was positive, then the planned approach for those patients, the minority of the patients in the overall trial, as you can see from the numbers, was to carry on with another cycle of chemotherapy but conclude with the involved field radiotherapy. The important randomized question addressed in the trial was what to do with the patients who have negative uh, imaging study at that point, and they were randomized to either stop their treatment or switch over to involved field radiotherapy. When the dust settles from the trial, it's a tie uh, between the two different approaches, that is radiotherapy or just further observation. And this makes it clear that if the patient is fortunate enough to have had an excellent initial response with negative functional imaging after a brief exposure to chemotherapy, that it isn't necessary to always to include radiotherapy for those patients. And so <clears throat> I'm going to settle here on uh, still acknowledging that there's, a, if you like, a choice. I don't think one should be dogmatic about choosing between these two different possible alternative approaches to patients with limited stage disease, but in each case, the emphasis is on a very high level of efficacy, curing the disease with a minimum amount of treatment, and one can approach these patients with either two cycles of ABVD and irradiation planned, or perhaps insert the use of functional imaging after two or three cycles, and if it's negative, consider those patients to be of such good prognosis that the involved field radiotherapy can be dropped and any penalty for doing so will be tiny with the o obvious option to reapproach those patients with additional treatment should they be in the small minority that relapse.